what's a community made up of? Anybody? People. And what do people, how, when communities are formed, how, do they, how are they formed? What is, what's it about? How are communities created and formed? Shared. Shared needs, shared values, common behaviors, commonality, common purpose, right? Whether you're the Catholic Church or the Boy Scouts or one of your companies, you have a shared vision. You have a, communi a communal view of the world, right? And so in this presentation, I wanted to unpack that a little bit because what we've seen, Joe and I, in the past year is that the communities have been siloed, similar to some of the bigger companies in the room. Have you, any, any of your big companies kind of siloed? You know, you have a little bit. I mean, I, I used to see it in some of the big companies I worked for that there was, there was a community of this group or that group. How do we get to we? How do we get to we is what I want to know, right? Because if we are we, we're going to make an impact, not just in our function, not just in our company, but in this community of Vation that can move very, very quickly together, right? So let's unpack that a little bit. I think there's two really core things that we've seen over the last year, and, and, and they're on this slide, and, and back at Cisco, my friends will tell you that Mr. Chambers used to, in his West Virginia accent, he used to, he used to say, you know, Julie Andrew, it's the power of the and, got to be able to do both, it's the power of the and. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to sell more and you're not going to get any more resources. <laughs> you ever heard that one, right? So it's, it's, the, it's that power of the and and every CEO in this room knows the power of the and. And the and that I want to challenge you with today is about both change and consistency. What we've seen at Vation in the last year is a lot of innovation. And when you think about innovation, you think about change. So on the left hand, your left hand side of the slide, what do you see there? What do you see? We got a flower going on. It's growing in a nice linear manner, isn't it? Nice linear growth. Everybody likes that, right? Okay. What's creating that? Linear growth? Energy. From that big ball of stuff that's out there right now that's drowning out my slide. That thing here in Arizona, that big ball of energy, it's pretty much right there this time every day. There's not a lot of days you don't see that thing right there at this time. The consistency of the energy drives the change in the organization, just like the flowers growing. Change needs some level of consistency is what we've seen, right? Luke, you've got a very fast growing company at Faction and You've put in pieces that are very consistent, though, the way you onboard people, the way you recognize them after five years with a Velvet Elvis, right? They have a great culture. At five years, you get your painting done as a Velvet Elvis. It is hilarious, right? It's a warm, fun culture. And that's consistency in the heart of one of the fastest changing companies I know of. Fantastic, right? I take my head off to you. On the other side of the slide, what do we see? We see Nebraska. <laughs> what else do we see? Environment. We see an environment. We're taking care of the environment year after year after year consistently. What else do we see? It's very well organized. How do they pick that stuff? They, they pick it like a distributor distributes at great scale, at great scale. They don't do it by hand anymore. It's with lots of machines, and it's, it's Im immense operational excellence. Right, Joe? You guys are good at that, right? And so how do we drive both change and consistency? What we've seen in Menlo Park with some of our startups, they got a great, a great technology idea. How many of those have we seen, Joe? Great technology ideas. Hundreds. And then they come before us and, and, and they, they have one hour to present and they, they leave one minute for go to market. No scale. So we take them aside and we say, you know, before we introduce you to some more of these folks, let's, 
Let's make sure that you have the ability to scale. Like, how do you take an order? Is it a bar napkin? How do you do that? So this is really important for you to consider in your company both change and scale. So I think Bob and Ken and probably Dave are going to talk a little bit about the, the 35 years that they've seen in this industry and the change that they've witnessed and what they think their specific community needs to go further. I wanted to take you to in a much more macro view. Okay, and I use this at the university quite often. Anybody familiar with Gapminder? Gapminder.org? Anybody willing to admit they're a nerd right now? Okay, Kurt, you and I, Saturday night, this is, this is what you're going to be doing, okay, now that you've been introduced to it. So Gapminder.org, if we could go to, uh, go to my laptop. Hans Rosling is a European statistician, and he collected statistics across all the countries in the world, and then he has hundreds of variables. This one happens to be income, how much people make against life expectancy. This blows me away. Now, he's got hundreds of variables, and Kurt, we'll be, Saturday night, we'll be putting up all sorts of X, Y charts, et cetera, et cetera. 1983 is when I got out of college, 1983. The, the size of the bubble is the size of the population of the country. The red bubbles are from Asia, the green bubbles are, are the Americas, the yellow bubbles are the European uh, countries, blue bubbles are African company, countries, okay? So these two big guys out here in 1983, India and China, U.S. is up here, right? That's 1983. From a macro perspective of change, let's go back as far as Hans went back with his data, which actually takes us back to about 1800, and let's see what happens country by country. Keep your eye, it's not hard to find India and China. The U.S. Is the, is the little green dot over there. So he started in the early 1800s. Notice that there's not a lot of diversity in terms of life expectancy. This is 40 years old, by the way, in 1800. 40 years old. I've been dead for 17 years at this point if this was today. This is $2,000 per capita, 1000 Okay, so you can see there's a really tight cluster in the world of, 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 how we, of how we see the world and how long we're living and how much money we're making. We're going to roll through the entire 1800s and look at the, nothing's happening in the 1800s. The U.S., you can see, is starting to slide to the right. The U.S. is this guy right over here. You've got the developed countries of Europe and the U.S. right over there. We're still at 40 years old, average life expectancy. We're all the way up to about $3,000 in income, okay? We hit 1,900 pretty quickly, and we're starting to slide upwardly to the right, okay? You're starting to see the dispersion and the change occurring around the world. Look at India and China. Nothing's happened yet. Okay, nothing's happened fundamentally, but we're starting to get this dispersion around the world. Innovation is starting to happen. Medicine is reaching out around the world. What happens in about 19, between 1915 and 1920? Yeah, watch. WW1 comes along, here's Germany. Just to show you, war is not really a good idea in terms of, in terms of life expectancy and income. Watch the Watch this thing move. Boom. There it went. Now what's amazing, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a 10% correction in the market, right? And then there was a V curve. The market came back up in the United States. Watch Germany come back. Boom. They're right back at top. What happens in 1940? Same thing. Germany takes a big hit. Japan takes a major hit. This is now Japan down in here, right? Right there. The U.S. accelerates. For, our, for many of us in this room, our, our parents may have been around in this time, we start to accelerate as a place that, that really did not have destruction outside of Hawaii to our, to our grounds. 
So we acceler accelerate pretty dramatically. We're now up, we're living to 67 years, that is, approximately. The rest of the world, India and China, is still less than 40 years. This is 70 years ago, right? As we move forward to 1983, when I got out of college, right there, that's where the story starts. Notice how India and China have begun to make the move. They've started to move up. Medicine is hitting Western China. India is getting clean water. It's starting to move. The size of those bubbles means there's more than a billion people in each of those countries. And now education from 1984 until now is gonna rapidly change the face of India and China. Ready? The slide to the right begins. Notice the US is not moving very quickly. When, when is the US gonna get passed up? The VCs that we visit with have a tremendous amount of capital being poured into the great Indian mines, the great Chinese mines, the, country, the companies that are coming to see us have an awful lot of diversity. The US has only 300 and something million people. We only graduate so many engineers a year. India and China graduate 10x the number we do. Think about that. That's the macro that's happening above and around us as we speak in this room. How can we embrace those massive countries with those massive numbers of engineers that are gonna innovate and change the world? So there's the food for thought. I'm sure that Bob and Ken and Dave are gonna talk about uh, change in, that they've seen in our industry. But from my perspective, from you know, 1983 to today, that was a very important macro thing that's happening and we should be paying attention to it. In our, country, in our companies need to be communities globally to, to leverage the talent that's coming from all over the world now. Would be the major change I see that's important, right? Diversity is key. All right, so in our companies, we always start, I teach innovation theory at the University of Denver and we have large companies like Gates and Johns Manville and other large Denver companies come in that have huge functional groups. And I always put this cartoon up because Innovate, now we've already tried that once, didn't really work. Anybody work in a company that's kind of had that one? You know? And the, it's funny that all of, the, all of the cartoons that this particular cartoonist has, the, the guy behind the desk always looks like me with glasses. I'm really worried about that, right? It's always that guy. So it's always a bad guy. Yes and no to change. It's really important. So let's talk about that as, as we look inside of the business school at Daniels. We're all familiar with what we see here. So in the last year, this is what Joe and I have witnessed, is that we see great ideas every day, and I mentioned that some of them struggle to, on the go-to-market side. We can all help them with that. If they struggle on the go-to-market side, they never leave seed or startup round. You may have seen it from some of the companies that you talked to yesterday. They're young, they got a great idea, and they want to talk about their thing. And they, channel strategy, we'll get there. We can all help them. We can move them forward with their great idea, right? If you go ahead and you move from that light bulb of money up the first growth phase, only one in 10 companies that start make it to established. One in 10. So I respect you guys immensely for having picked line card items or in your, or in your end user world, Torian, of, of who are the one in 10 that are actually gonna make it. I'm gonna bet my job on somebody and they're gone. Vation wants to help you with that with the research capability, the collaboration with those guys to make sure that they're gonna be there. More than one in 10. I don't wanna bet on one in 10. I like going to Vegas. Joe likes going to Vegas. We play craps. We lose money. That's fun. Doing it in business, that ain't fun. <laughs> so one in 10 get to establish only 5%, fewer than 5% ever see the second level of growth. So one in 10 get there. Of that, one in 20 make it to the next one. Think of the challenge that we have as leaders around here, right? 
If you've made it to your first level of growth, or first level of being established, congratulations, great job. You're probably close to done. 19 out of 20 are close to done at that point. That's just the statistics. When I look around the room, oh, I'm sorry, corporate gravity is the reason why. GDP, what's GDP today? Anybody know? Forecasted GDP for the US is three, right? It's getting, it's, it's moving forward. It's 285, three, it's gonna be a little over three. Trump's telling us it's gonna be 10, right? So <laughs> it's gonna be huge. It's gonna be huge. So <laughs> sorry, I'm not a political, I've, now that I work at a university, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of left-leaning people at a university. <laughs> Mark's like, hey, lighten up on that. So <laughs> at any rate, there's, there's this thing that I look at as corporate gravity, it's called GDP. When you're an established company, you can probably do your forecast off of a multiple of GDP. While Julie and Andrew and I worked together at Cisco, for the commercial business, it was pretty much 4x GDP. GDP was one, we were gonna, be, we were gonna grow at four. If it was two, we were gonna grow at eight. That was a pretty good way to, that was our gravity. That was our North Star, right? So you could track, you could probably look at your company and look at GDP, go back 30 years, forward 30 years, and see if you have corporate gravity associated with GDP, okay? I looked at some of us and I said, wow, Sky High is an example. They're a guy, Kristen is, was hired and she was brought in there going through the first growth phase. Got acquired by McAfee, great job. XIO, Bill and Mark. They, had the, they reached the first level of established company as a storage company. Bill has come in and pivoted the company to edge compute. It's brilliant. Tip my cap to him. I believe XIO will hit the next level of growth. They'll be one of the one in 20 because these guys are brilliant. Okay, you look at Cisco on the chart. Cisco, I take my hat off because not only has it as it reached the first level of established, it then accelerated into a next level established. And what's Chuck doing now? He's doing security, he's doing as a service. 36% of your revenues are now recurring, I think. 36, 38, amongst friends. 40, 45. <laughs> That's a phenomenal effort by the entire Cisco team to continue to a next level of acceleration. And many of you in this room benefit from that. So you gotta think that through. When you look inside of your companies to drive the changes, to drive the innovation and not squash it, not be the guy who looks like me behind the desk with the glasses going, yeah, we tried it. You have to build a model for innovation within your company that is consistently executed against. MIT Sloan gives us this perspective, these four boxes. Every MIT Sloan, they're not the University of Denver, but it's pretty good, it's okay. They're hot, we'll kill them in hockey, right? So, at any rate, right, Murph? We will, we'll get them in hockey. Do they have a hockey, does MIT have a hockey team? Sure. Do they? Really smart one, probably. <laughs> so the, you know, the MIT gives us this two by two, you gotta have a two by two, but when you think about your company, which box do you sit in? The two axes are really important. So you got the organizational ownership and you've, you've got the resource authority. So intentionally, Len, what box is our organization gonna execute against? Because we don't have a strategy that says we are gonna be executing innovation in our culture in one of these boxes, the culture will eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner all day long. There's no chance of innovation if you have not laid out your strategy, pick a box, Make a decision, right? And so when you lay this out, it's, it's a pretty simple, we're gonna be organizationally diffused, which means every BU is going to try to make their own decision and invest in their own funds. So that origin point is a very decentralized view. Actually, they, they listed Google top left. I would argue that Google is more bottom left. Google gives every employee 20% of their time to do whatever they wanna do with it. I'm kind of old school, that, that, I'm, I'm worried that you know, if I had 20% of my time to do anything I wanted, I'd be out here, <laughs> right? But you know, hey, all the way to the top right where you have 
a dedicated organization and they have dedicated funds. That's an expensive organization. Bell Labs has survived four different acquisitions over the last hundred years because they were separated, they were different, they're not held to a quarterly P&L. And they're amazingly successful at driving innovation. One way or the other, you make the call, right? My, my advice to you is make the call. Four models tightly tied to GDP, and it's about change management. What Vation wants to help you do is pick one of those models, understand how difficult it is, and help you through the change. Way too often, we underestimate change, right? I can remember back in, in a day where, while I was at Cisco, Mr. Mr. Chambers occasionally, you know, we had change was part of our culture tab. It was right on our belt. And John, you know, so you're sitting in a meeting and John would be doing his walking around the room, hey, how you doing? Nice to see you. How, how do you like change, Kurt? You like change? And you know, it's on your belt. So you're like, oh, this is an IQ test, <laughs> you know? Oh, I love change. It's on my belt, of course. And he'd look at somebody, he'd go, so how'd that last divorce go for you? I, <laughs> John, we're going to be in HR if you keep that. But he was driving home a point that change is hard. Can be good, can be bad. Can be a vicious cycle, it can be a virtuous cycle, but it's hard. We at Vation want to help you through that. Okay? Oops. Past priorities and new priorities. Anybody ever get a new boss? Anybody ever get a new boss once a quarter? Sorry, Terry, I use <laughs> I'm the prime example for you, right? <laughs> Sorry. We got to get through these change pieces one by one. You can't stip, skip the steps and change. Kotler is an excellent way for you to walk through change and get your organization to buy into it. Because what you see on here is reality. The research tells you that the moment, you know, hence the moment that you step on your platform at peak in front of your employees and say, I got great news, it's January 1, we're going to change something. How long does it take his individual contributor to think about what's in it for them? Less than a nanosecond between Vince is changing something and I don't know if I like it. That's just human activity, right? So as you think about change, as, you, as leaders, you go back and you say, hey, we're going to bring innovation. They're really cool. Joe drives, Joe, Joe, Joe dress is really cool. He's a happening guy, and then there's this old guy. We're going to bring these guys in, and we're going to change. Your whole organization's going to go, what the? Right? Why? Why do we need to change? I was happy. Right? And all of a sudden, you're touching my cheese and throwing it around the room. You got, I got balls in the air. So we want to help you through that. How we adopt innovation, two considerations. Right? The first is map the difficulty factor. When you use this particular method, that's actually from Bain, you understand that if you're going to your current customer set with just a little bit of a new idea, it's really easy to, to drive that change into your customer base, into your function. However, don't expect a lot of growth out of that. Research says that's, that's, you're going to drive operational excellence, you're going to drive a little bit of change, you're going to go to your current customers with something, that's pretty much what you got, 3 to 5% growth, just raise quotas. I'll jump all the way to the far box, the fourth box out there. Fourth box is, we're going to go sell something to somebody we don't know. Let's do this, right? We're going to go sell something to somebody we don't know. That is a massive change, massive change. So what I'm recommending to you, this is a very easy two by two. Print this one off, put it on your desk, and when your people come in and say, I'd like to do this, are we going towards new customers with new processes or products? Are we going to our same customers with basically the same stuff? Really easy. How hard is it? Now hard, if you can pull that off, Amazon launched AWS. They were selling books to everybody. Now they're selling infrastructure to everybody, <laughs> right? Phenomenal example of a box four that has worked in a major, major way, right? 
ESPN was a good example of how you can structure things. When they, you know, they had ESPN, the, the TV piece, and they brought out the magazine. They have store, you probably see the stores in the airports. Everyone got their own P&L so that they could grow on their own, so that the, the, the TV component that drove all the revenue didn't smash them. How do you organize around change? So the big key takeaways over the past year, and then Joe's gonna give you the reprise to this in the end of the day. For us, what we saw is fundamentally a couple of dimensions that are key areas of change from Menlo Park to Main Street. On the left-hand side, technology is changing ever more rapidly and your business model needs to change with it, right? So the, the technology that they're investing in, if you look at the Sequoia set of, of invested companies, 120 companies, more than half software as a service, security, uh, recurring revenue models, right? Very different. Julie, Andrew, I got great news. They got nobody building switches. Nobody building a hardware switch. If EMC were in the room, EMC, well, we kind of, did you buy those guys yet? <laughs> Not yet, you're working on it? <laughs> okay. You know, nobody's building a round brown spinning thing. No money's being spent there. It's all on the left side of this chart. How do we embrace that? How do we make that happen? On the right hand side of the chart, the product to market fit is, is, is just dramatically shortened. Dramatically shortened. The window for the product market fit, the timing of it, and the partnering models around it are very important, very important. Key areas of consistency. You know, we still need to do our research. We need to find that one in 10, the one in 20 that will fit our line card, that will be able to fit our go to market, right? We still need to do our research. We still need to collaborate. We need to collaborate around this community, not just within our company. We need to collaborate more, more deeply. We need to go to market and we still need to listen to our customers, right you guys? We should listen to our customers because they, they're, they're gonna tell us that's a good idea or that's a bad idea, right? And we should have platform business models that we talked about last year here. So how do I bring it home? Over 35 years and the changing environment that we saw from the, from the macro of the country changes and life expectancy, thank God the life expectancy has changed. Jeff, we'd have been dead a while ago. So, you know, out of all that macro change, relationships matter. We've seen that the entire year. I've seen it my entire career. When I teach at the University of Denver, the students usually say, geez, you look like you had a decent career out here on, on LinkedIn. I'm like, yeah, I lie a lot. But the, you know, the, the, the relationship of a father and a son, the relationship of a business partner, the relationship of our clients, relationships still matter. I know my millennial will probably say there's new ways to have relationships, there's more ways to communicate, but a relationship is built on trust. A relationship is built on value exchange. If you don't receive any value, you're probably not gonna be in a sustainable relationship. Relationships still matter. Communities matter a lot. So I'm gonna leave you with two visuals, okay? On the relationship one, in this room is a lot of air, thank God. Air is made up, the relationship in air is 78% nitrogen, 21, you'd already know this, 21% oxygen, a little bit of argon, and an itty bitty little bit of carbon dioxide that the trees are taking care of for us. If that relationship changes by just a few percentage points in any way, we're not having a meeting here today. That's how important relationships are in our business. You are the heir for your community. You are the heir for your company. You're the heir that all your customers breathe. Relationships matter. Second thing that really matters to us is community. As I mentioned when we started, that there's a lot of communities in this room and we think that there's, there's now one community that can collaborate really quickly. And when you collaborate really, really quickly in a community, you can do phenomenal things. 
excavations of a part with arrow by the way of uh, of sponsoring an innovation home in Denver right it's only our second year in business but I believe in being a part of the community so with that be our air right stop <laughs> and enjoy your day here with Vation